Today is the fourth day of Lent. It is that day in which penitential mourning in this season gives way to God's love and joy. This Sunday actually has a name in the Christian tradition, Laetere. It, is, it comes from the Catholic Mass, Laetere Jerusalem. Rejoice, O Jerusalem. This theme of joy came to be celebrated in the ancient church in various ways. A rose on the altar connects the beauty of spring and the thorns of suffering. As early as the 11th century, this custom of flowers symbolized the celebration of the midpoint of Lent. Today, we continue our journey back to love, and we have a rose on the altar. It's in relation to and celebration of Graham Butkash, who was born this week to Caitlin and Michael. And so our rose comes naturally, thanks to Graham's birth. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We are on a journey back to love. Who would have imagined that our love for one another would most fully be demonstrated by wearing masks, by wearing gloves and gowns, and by constantly washing our hands. Who would have thought 366 days ago that expressions of true love would be all about isolating, staying apart, not embracing, and then getting a shot in our shoulder when our number came up? And who would have thought that the United States of America, with all of our vast medical abilities and scientific discoveries, would lead the world in unnecessary and untimely deaths, largely because this nation politicized a battle with a virus. Instead of seeing the virus as a viral hitchhiker who hitched a ride on our love and good intentions and wreaked havoc when it arrived at its destination, we turned it into a battle between ourselves. Yesterday, as the first anniversary of COVID-19 in the world came round. First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, Columbus, Ohio, was lifted up in the news because Mr. Mark and our teenagers had a vision and had courage. This church has become a beacon of light on Broad Street and a silent witness to our one-year vigil in the pandemic battle against SARS-CoV-2, most commonly known as COVID-19. On our behalf, and on behalf of every person in our community, our nation, and our world, our youth and Mr. Mark planted white flags on the West Lawn in November 2020 to symbolize the horrible loss of life that we had witnessed with COVID-19. At the time, those, those flags were 270,000 in number. They were 270 with 1,000 souls each represented. But now the number is much higher. In Ohio, we have lost 17,871 lives to COVID-19. In our church, in our extended family of faith alone, we've lost close to 30 of our beloved ones. These flags and our lawn have become a place where people come to pray. It has also become a place where news stations choose to do live shots at all hours of the day and night because here they can focus in a visual way on the pain and the grief and the loss we've experienced. These tiny white flags have become a symbolic gathering place for our collective grief and loss. One year ago today, that's how many people had died of COVID-19 in the United States of America, 10. 10 people had died a year ago today. One year later, 
More than 29 million Americans have tested positive for COVID-19, and more than 527,000 have died. As of this morning, the world has lost 2,634,370 souls. And we know that there are many more unreported or misreported deaths as well. Last Wednesday night, in this sanctuary, we held a service of remembrance and hope. At the time of the viewing, there were about 45 people simultaneously viewing. Since then, 110 people have seen the service. It was a service of word and music, of prayers and candlelight and spirit. It was a service of love. And at the end, masked and here with Emily and Mark and Kevin and Melissa and Peter, I lost it. I broke down. I began sobbing uncontrollably. I just kept whispering, I am so sorry that you are gone. I am so sorry you all died too soon. I wish you were here. Today, as we reach the midpoint of Lent on our way to the cross, there is respite from the rigors of penitence, and that's a good thing. In the midst of the often trivialized moralizing which happens in this season, the Gospel of John opens to the third chapter and gives us this refreshing essence of our faith, the Gospel in miniature. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So rejoice, people of God. Rejoice. God loves the world. God's son loves the world. Christ came into the world, and we have to remember, he didn't come into the First Congregational Church or the Christian Church or any particular religion. God didn't come into Columbus or Ohio or the United States, but into the world, the entire world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Right in the middle of Lent and right at the one-year mark of our physical separation from one another, this day gives us pause. Somewhere be between the beginning of Lent and its midpoint, somewhere between the beginning of each of our lives and this point, somewhere between the outbreak of this horrific pandemic and this moment, too many of us have forgotten or lost track of what an amazing gift we have in the love of God through our Savior, God's Son, Jesus Christ. It's good to be reminded of this today. It is also good to remember and rejoice in the truth that God is not about the business of condemning people or the rest of the world or any of us. While others may want to play God and manipulate the words of God for judgment and not grace, God is about the business of loving and saving the rest of the world and each one of us. But what does God's loving and saving business look like? John 3, 14 and 15 tells us that life in God's love through Christ is uplifting and eternal. Like Moses, serpent in the wilderness, Jesus is lifted up, both on the cross and in the ascension into glory. And in this lifting, belief in God's sacrifice and glory are given shape and given form, and eternal life is offered. Uplifting and eternal are central themes to God's saving love. And I have seen the uplifting and eternal nature of God's love so often become manifest in the love and through suffering and pain that people share in difficult and tumultuous times. 
While I sometimes wish that I could wave a magic wand over pain that I see embodied in suffering, I am also aware that so much of the immensity of love would be diminished and even unrecognizable without it. To suffer in love for the one whom you love in the midst of their suffering is to live life to its holiest. You have told me this. You have shown me this. I believe we actually come to see eternal life in the face of such suffering. We see grace twisted by pain, but embraced by love. We see a peace which passes human understanding that grows forth from the depth of suffering. I think of love when I think of the pain in the paintings of Vincent van Gogh. To imagine that one man could have seen such beauty and brought such color into this world of ours while feeling such pain and inmost torture is almost inconceivable. While he suffered emotionally and mentally, Vincent van Gogh portrayed such vivid beauty outside of himself. One painting named The Disposition has always moved me deeply. The Disposition depicts the scene at the foot of the cross following the death of Jesus. His body has been disposed from the cross to the earth below. As the dead body of Jesus lies at the foot of the cross, John, the author of today's gospel text, is there beside him, having washed his body of blood. And there is Jesus' mother. Mary is, is looking on. She's close at hand, but her face is terribly twisted in pain. Her body's halfway turned toward him and halfway turned away from him. In the distance, you see several people, including the shadowy figure of Peter, who has denied and abandoned Jesus in his time of greatest need, in his time of crucifying death. For those who have stood by the cross, for those who have stood by him in his suffering, there is intense pain in this painting, but their pain is holy pain. For those who have tortured him and abandoned him, the pain is very different. It is a pain of guilt and shame. It is the pain of dispossession. Uplifting and eternal are elements of God's saving love, and such love is often experienced even in the pain of dispossession. And honestly, it is what we do at the face of the cross and at the foot of the cross which matters the most. To experience God's uplifting and eternal love, we have to go there. We must abide there. The ones who teach us about the saving love of God are the ones in our lives who show us in their suffering how to love God, how to praise God, and how to be of service to others. Stephen Shoemaker tells the story of such a woman in his book, God Stories. Jean was a woman who had been disabled all her life. As a young woman, she had been too embarrassed about the way she looked with her disabilities to go to church and certainly to be baptized. So later in life, Stephen baptized her in her nursing home bed. When she was close to death, and taking massive doses of medicine to reduce her pain, Stephen came and visited with Jean. She smiled at him and said, the only thing that helps me in my pain is liquid morphine. This may sound silly to you, Pastor, but the morphine is the most beautiful color of blue I have ever seen. Her improbable praise in the midst of her pain brought tears to Stephen. Jean, like so many I have come to know in my ministry, reached a point in her battle for life 
in which she could no longer keep going. I have heard words like this, God, you've been in my actions, you've guided my life, you've walked with me through all I've encountered. Now be with me in my dying, lift me and carry me in your arms into the heavenly dwelling place that you call home. God, I can no longer care for my family. I hate that worse than anything. So I leave them in your hands, Lord. So send your angels of mercy and love to them. Help them accept your presence in their lives, however you choose to make your love manifest. Sadly, in this past year, many of our loved ones and those whose names we do not know and will never know have died alone. They've died alone except for the abiding love of God and the incredible care and love of doctors and nurses and nurses' aides who have been by their side. Thanks be to God that they were not entirely alone, even though we were not with them. When such words as those words spoken above are words that our loved ones say, they come into our hearts and minds and healing happens. It is a healing deeper and broader than the body which is destined for death a healing that is a final union with God. From such as these, I have learned not only how to die, but they have taught me how to live. I have learned to offer my passion to God as well as my well-intentioned actions. And at the heart of today's gospel, we've come once again to this simple and clear truth. God is love. Mother Teresa of Calcutta once wrote of John 3.16, the good news is that God still loves the world through you. You are God's good news. You are God's love in action. And each time anyone comes in contact with us, they must become different and better because of having met us. We must radiate God's love. God is still loving the world, and by many accounts, it is not a world that is easy to love. There is terror and war and hunger and ecological devastation and political divides and hate crimes and crazy online conspiratorial groups. There's poverty beyond imagination and racial, racial and economic injustice. And those are just some of the elements of the inhumanity of humans to other humans that makes this world hard to love. And nevertheless, and I always say God is in the nevertheless, God continues to love the world. God loves the unlovable and the unlovely. God loves the lonely who have no one else to love them. And God loves the man who never thinks of God. God loves the woman who lives in God's presence continually. And God loves the graceless and the graceful. God loves the one who has never given a thought to God and doesn't have a clue how to pray, and the one who seeks God and prays without ceasing. And God loves the one who's angry at God, who hates God, and God loves the one who is content in God. God loves the one who spits at God and the one who smiles at God. God loves you just the same as God loves me. As St. Augustine wrote, God loves each of us as if there was only one of us to love. As we head into the last half of Lent, having been filled at this oasis with the grace on this Sunday and the love on this Sunday that comes to us in the gospel, may we remember that there will always be misunderstandings. There will always be words that are spoken or spit at us that do not reflect love in any way. There will always be someone to spread a tale about you to others. There will always be unkindness. And there will always be viruses. 
There will always be wars and rumors of wars. But there will always be something else as well. And this is what you need to cling to. There will always be God's deep and broad love that is uplifting and eternal. And it will always be with each of us. And there will always be Jesus who will always show us the way to love. Amen.